For those of you who haven't heard of my website, it's wonderground.com or weatherunderground.com. Either one will get you there. And right now, we're about the 100th largest website on the entire internet. We get about 10 million unique users per month. Uh, the Weather Channel is the largest weather website on the internet. Uh, they're about number 30 for uh, any site on the internet, and they get about 30 million unique users. So between the two of us, the Weather Channel actually bought Weather Underground last year. We can get our message in front of a heck of a lot of people, and if you have a message that you want to get in front of some people, well, think about how it could play on one of our two websites and get a hold of me. So my old job before I founded the Weather Underground was as a hurricane researcher. I spent four years down in Miami flying with the NOAA P3 research aircraft and put together uh, some scientific work. And in the process of flying into hurricanes, well, after four years, it turns out that I had a, a very bad flight into a hurricane known as Hurricane Hugo. We were expecting a Category 3 hurricane when we got there and found it was actually a Category 5 and, well, hit 5.5 Gs of acceleration. The pilot lost control of the aircraft. We had an engine catch on fire in the eye wall. Uh, while well, I'm standing here, so I obviously made it out, but it was a lucky thing. We coasted into the eye wall. The pilot pulled us out 900 feet above the water, put the fire out in the engine, and, well, there we were in the eye of a Category 5 hurricane at 900 feet and barely made it in with four engines, had to make it out with three. Uh, you can read the whole story there online. It took me a long time to write. I had a camera, so I uh, documented it, and this story has actually really been uh, a genesis of where I am now today as being a, a communicator. People read that story and they share it with people and uh, that's gotten my uh, website a lot of attention over the years. So uh, a good story is a good one to tell to bring people in. Uh, th um, this is a story for another time. I'm going to tell a different story today. Uh, actually, this story is going to appear on the National Geographic channel next year, complete with actors playing myself and some of the key players on the flight, the CGI of stuff flying around inside of the cabin. It should be quite a show. Okay, after I stepped off that aircraft, I said I'm all done being a hurricane scientist. <laughs> I'm going back to graduate school. So I went back to the University of Michigan where I had gotten my master's degree and started working in air pollution under Perry Sampson, my advisor. And while I was there in 1991, uh, I found about this cool thing called the internet, which you know I'd heard about but you know didn't know much about, and found out that we had a satellite dish on our roof that we could get all the world's weather information from. And well, we had a workstation, a sun workstation I could look at it on. And I said, wow, this is super cool. I mean, I can, you know, I got my hands on all the weather data of the whole world. But nobody else can see it. You know, that's no good. So I wrote a little program for a graduate level course called Interactive Science Computing, uh, my first C program. And it was this little menu-based telnet session that then we turned loose over the entire University of Michigan so that anyone on campus could load this program here and get the weather for any place in the world. Well, that was cool. But it turned out back then that the internet was run out of Ann Arbor. The backbone was based there, run by a company called Merit Networking. And they said, well, you know, you don't have to limit it just to Ann Arbor. If you attach it to a TCP IP port on the back of your Unix machine, you can have the entire internet access it. So we said, okay, that sounds cool. So we did that. And we turned it loose to the entire internet. So this is the growth curve through time, starting in 1991 when we first started this, about how many unique users per week we had on this service. So in the red line there, you see um, the growth in usage. And what happened here to really kick things off was a, hur was a hurricane, Hurricane Bob, which hit Long Island back in 1991. And just through word of mouth, uh, this service started growing and growing and growing. You know, next thing I knew, I was getting emails from people in Israel and Bangkok and so on saying, hey, this is cool. So we kept adding to it. We got some National Science Foundation funding to do more with this because uh, this was a great way to use the internet to do science education. It made sense. I mean, weather, science, and using the internet. Uh, NSF really wanted to drive this because you know, they thought the internet was a great emerging technology to do education. So we got some NSF grants. We put this on another machine. So now we had two machines running this service. And I was informed by Merit Networking that by the year 1992 through 1993, this was the most popular service of any kind on the entire internet. This was before the World Wide Web and graphics and so on. 
So we had to come up with a name for this whole service, and my PhD advisor, Perry Sampson, uh, being an old 60s uh, radical, said, well, you know, it'd be a cute tongue-in-cheek reference to the old radical group Weather Underground, which also got its start at the University of Michigan, you know, to name our, our little educational project this. So we did that, and it's their, their name, they, they were called the Weathermen. They actually got their name from uh, a line of a Bob Dylan song, which was uh, Subterranean Homesick Blues. So there you go. We got our name partially from a Bob Dylan song, partially from a radical group. Uh, so it was a cute thing to do for an uh, educational project. And we were based out of this laboratory uh, in Ann Arbor called the Michigan Atmospheric Deposition Laboratory. It had one of the great acronyms of all time, Mad Lab. And if you wanted to connect to our little Telnet service, you were actually, you type in a command, Telnet Mad Lab, and it would connect to this computer and give you what you wanted. So in the uh, 1994 period, 95, we started adding graphics to it using the old Gopher protocol. And then in 1995, the World Wide Web came along. Uh, during this time, we were doing a lot of teacher workshops, uh, which was kind of painful because you spent more time getting the teachers on the internet than actually doing science. And so that was quite a learning experience. We tried an interesting experiment in doing internet science education by having a community access cable where we would do live TV shows from Mad Lab here and talk about disasters, weather disasters, and engage our audience by having them via email send us you know, questions and try and you know, do an interactive sort of, you know, they could ask us about the particular disaster. Well, it was kind of a failure. Nobody really got on the email and did anything. But uh, it was a great way to waste the National Science Foundation money. Uh, we actually hired a comedian and a puppeteer with National Science Foundation funds for this project. Uh, it really didn't get a lot of attention from the, the K through 12 community, so we moved on. Okay, in 95, NSF said you should go commercial because uh, you know we don't want to support you forever. So we said, okay, we'll go commercial. What, what should our name be? Well, all right, let's keep the name Weather Underground. Well, maybe naming a business after a terrorist group is not a good idea. I don't know. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, a metaphor. It gets attention, which is good. Uh, Ford Motor Company never did advertise with us because of our name, though. So uh, there was a downside to doing that. Uh, but back then, you know, this is a wild, crazy internet. Uh, you could name your company Yahoo, you know, and be successful. So we got away with the name Weather Underground. And by 1997, the Ann Arbor News was featuring us. And uh, we worked very hard to build up an audience and... Uh, for the next oh, six, seven, eight years, I was working very hard, basically being a Unix system administrator, writing a lot of code, creating all the graphics we use on the website, doing almost no meteorology. But in, 19, or in 2005, that all changed when the blogosphere started coming around. I started writing blogs. This is my first blog. I talked about a 360-degree rainbow I saw from uh, my aircraft. And uh, I had trouble coming up with topics for a while. I mean, you know, what do you blog about? Well, uh, hurricane season of 2005 came along, and that quickly fixed that. Katrina came along, and uh, boy, I sure had plenty to write about. So here's an example of uh, what my blog looks like. Uh, I blog mostly about hurricanes during hurricane season. Uh, when there's tornadoes, I talk about tornadoes. Uh, I really enjoy uh, delving into certain aspects of uh, floods. I, 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 you know, the Army Corps, what they're doing is fascinating to me. Uh, and I'm an encyclopedia of disaster, so uh, I really know all the stats on disaster, and I'm very good about connecting weather disasters to climate change. So I do talk a lot about climate change. My current post that's up there is about the European floods and how it's due to an extreme jet stream pattern that perhaps is getting more frequent due to climate change. So my blogs are fairly wide re widely read. A typical post uh, during hurricane season will get you know, 200,000 page views in a day. Uh, some of my slower periods when there's nothing much going on, I talk about climate change, probably 100,000 page views in a day. Uh, my record is 2 million page views in one day during Hurricane Sandy's landfall. Uh, my comment section of my blog is not the standard comment section of a blog. I mean, most bloggers go and, you know, they respond to how their users, uh, you know, are 
enjoying the topic. Mine is just totally off topic a lot of the time. Uh, there's a lot of crazy stuff in there. I don't know how Mike and Gavin do it on Real Climate, you know, always going in there and answering questions. I can't possibly do that in mine because I get, you know, thousands of comments every day and uh, they're all over the place. They're not always nice. You know, here's the, the AGU, AGW uh, uh, bantering get, gets uh, kind of hostile sometimes. But there's also some great stuff in the comment section of my blog. In fact, there's been an entire charity founded based on the comment section of my blog. Uh, I've got a lot of fans there. It turns out that 25% uh, of Wonderground's page views are from 1% of the users, and a lot of them are fans of my blog. So back when Hurricane Ike hit in 2008, uh, a bunch of them got together and said, you know, we're going to take a truck and uh, send it to the disaster zone and uh, give them some of these supplies. So. Uh, they formed their own charity. That charity is now um, working in the Sandy Hit devastation zone. They got a quarter million grant to help disabled people. They've distributed over $2 million worth of goods and services now. So quite a, a crazy thing to come out of a blog in the blog comments. Uh, there have also been a pair of people that uh, met in my blog in the comments online and ended up getting married. <laughs> Nutty stuff. Uh, another cool thing uh, about our website, uh, the, the thing that has really worked for us is engaging people, allowing them to interact with us. They do it through my blog comments. They can start their own blogs. They can upload their own digital weather photos. Uh, here's an example of a user of our weather photo, our wonder photos we call them. She actually went and made an entire book you can get on Amazon that's got pictures that users uploaded to our website. So quite a community we've developed there. It, it's been just totally stunning to me what, what's happened, this wave I've been riding, totally unexpected. And uh, I've learned a lot of things along the way. I've learned it's good not to be, you know, this dispenser of facts, this inhuman, you know, PhD that's uh, highly educated but not a person. Uh, there's two books I highly recommend to read about that. Uh, Randy Olson's book about Don't Be Such a Scientist and Joe Rahm's book Language Intelligence, which I'm going to leave a copy up here for you to um, examine if you want. It talks about metaphors, storytelling, the kinds of things scientists aren't very good at sometimes. I also recommend climatecommunication.org, uh, who doesn't have a representative here, so I'm uh, talking up Susan Hassel's points here. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this, about the bad words to use that people don't understand. I mean, radiation, they think nuclear, you know, but you should talk solar energy. I never use the word anthropogenic. I say human caused. I never use the word uh, convection. I say heavy thunderstorm activity. A lot of things like that. You shouldn't use too many buzzwords. We have a climate change section on our website where we say in very simple terms these five points here. Uh, again, lessons I learned from listening to a lot of the communicators we have in the audience. Customer support is essential for a successful business. I mean, I'm always answering questions from the, the people out there who uh, want to know things. And even the deniers, I'll send a nice reply to and reflect at them. And a lot of times they'll read it back and say, oh, that was kind of a jerky thing to say, wasn't it? Uh, but a lot of times you just leave it at that when they get, come back at you again. There's just no reasoning with deniers, so uh, you just move on. If you haven't read at least one of these books, you should read at least one of them. And some of the people in the audience are actually authors of these books. I'm a fan of customizing your message to where your audience lives. We have a local climate change section on our website. And here I've plotted up over the last 100 years what the temperature in Boulder, Colorado has done. It's risen by 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit per century. And then now this is the forecast taken from uh, some of the Maurer et al. downscale data. So some other lessons I've learned. I won't bother reading them. You can see for yourself. We do have a Facebook account. It's got 260,000 likes. I don't do much with it because I got my hands full just blogging. And Twitter, we've got uh, 77,000 followers now. All of my blogs are auto-tweeted. I don't personally do any tweets myself. We got sold to the Weather Channel last year, which has been quite an experience. Uh, they sent me on kind of a tour. I got to uh, share the stage with uh, an actor fellow. Can you identify who the actor and who the CEO of Weather Channel is? Well, this is the CEO of Weather Channel. He's an environmentalist. He's been very good about uh, wanting to get more climate change stuff on their site. So uh, he kind of wrote me into doing this, uh, this doom sort of uh, 
we know what happens if the methane gas explosion happens, the super volcano, all of that, that, that aired earlier this year. Uh, I had to give a talk to the climate, uh, or to the Weather Channel meteorologists, some of who are very skeptical, which is available online here if you want to use it for your own purposes. And it's been a little bit of an educational project or a process here having to bring uh, climate change to the Weather Channel. Uh, they don't have a climate change section on their website per se, although they do have climate change news. They are starting to run more climate change videos now on their on-air component. And uh, this fall, I want to talk more later, this is a workshop about how we can uh, push this. They're running a six-part series called Tipping Points, where they're going to you know, have shows about Greenland, about uh, rising sea levels, and so on. And that will be uh, a good opportunity for us to you know, kind of cross-promote. And here's the producer here. It's an independent producer. So I guess the, maybe that one didn't work out for us. But anyways, uh, if you have an idea about a story that would be good on Weather Channel, I want to hear about it. More information is good as far as I'm concerned. There's a lot of times I get surprised by you know, papers that I didn't know were going to come out in science. And you know, we have a huge audience. And take advantage of it. You know, email me with your ideas on what can appear there. Uh, I don't always have time to reply, especially if there's a hurricane hitting the U.S. Um, but certainly I read all my emails, and, and I want more ideas about ideas we can put on both the, the Weather Channel cable and online. So with that, turn it over to the next one.